You're now listening to The Brian Callen Show. Considered the hottest podcast in the universe. Now get ready for the heat. Here's Brian Callen. Well, today's podcast is brought to you by Hover.com. Hover is domain management made simple. It is the easiest and quickest way to buy a domain name. Hover is honest. It never tries to upsell you at checkout. Everything the other guys extra charge for is included in the cost of your domain, like who is privacy and domain forwarding. And plus, Hover has the best customer support in the industry. They have a no-hold phone policy. That means if you run into a problem, you call Hover, and a real, live human being answers the phone, ladies and gentlemen. I actually get excited. It's, It's just so rare, right? So basically, it takes the hassle out of getting a domain. That is what they are selling. You just type in a few keywords you want in the search box, and it'll tell you what's available. And the cool thing is they specialize in .NET. So a lot of times you get it, you want something in .com or .org, it's not available, try .NET. That is their specialty. And Hover has valet transfers. What does that mean? Well, if you've got a domain somewhere else, they'll take care of the whole process of moving the domain to Hover for you. So they specialize in .NET and they now offer Google Apps. You can get Gmail, Calendar, Drive, Docs, the whole package. You got 25 gigabytes of storage and, you know, Google's a huge company, let's be honest. Hard to get a hold of a real person, I'm sure, but Hover has a human being that specializes in Google Apps. So, if you got a business, you got a family, you got a group, you want the ability to share all kinds of stuff with, try Hover.com. See how it works. They'll give you a 30-day free trial uh, with the Google Apps as well. So, you know, see what you think. And the best part, guess what? If you go to Hover.com slash Brian, B-R-Y-A-N, well, that's a promo code that gets you 10% off a new domain name. Oh, man. The power I have to get you 10% off. There it is, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Brian Callen slash Hunter Moth. Oh, that's an upgrade. You see that? That's I'm a really you an upgrade. big upgrade. <laughs> the slash Hunter Moth show. Um, Dan Coyle is our guest, and uh, he's written a book called The Talent Code, and um, I, uh, I'm, uh, you know, I know you're obsessed with this book. As I am I. so obsessed with this book. Uh, it, it, it's just, you, you look, Dan. You went off and you, you know, you went off and f- you, you saw that there were these hotbeds of talent. Yep. And you know, for example, this tennis court, this this rickety, penniless tennis club in Russia with one court. They teach group lessons. They spend a lot of time not even hitting balls. Yet they put out. You know, countless world champions. Anna Kurnikova, Maria Sharapova, <clears throat> yeah. all of those people. Yeah, all the povas, all the ovas. Uh, you you got a, a school in <laughs> Dallas that puts out a bunch of you know pop sensations like Jessica Simpson, who I did a pilot yep. with. Don't worry about it. And then <laughs> it, you know it just goes on and on. And it what it's fascinating. We had um, David Epstein on who talked about how important genes are in certain. Uh, in getting to be very good yep. at something. You're not yep. playing in the major leagues unless you have perfect eyesight or better than perfect eyesight. You're not sprinting in the finals of the world championships in the Olympics or the world championships unless you are of West African descent and, by the way, probably from the Biafra coast, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The, the best uh, long-distance runners are from a very small area of Kenya. Yep. But having said that, you know, most of us, most of us mere mortals know the and if, especially if you've gotten good at something, we all know the transformative effects, and you call it the holy shit effect, which is hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> of practice and 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 what you term to be what you call deep practice. Yep. Um, yep. I'm obsessed with it. I I love it. I've done. I've I've chased it my whole life, not just in sport, but certainly as a comic. Um, yep. So. So maybe uh, maybe maybe talk to us a little bit about first of all what got you interested in writing this book. Yeah, well, you know, I, I think everything kind of goes back to uh, whatever happens to us when we're when we're little. And I grew up with a year a brother a year older than me, a brother a year younger than me, and we liked to compete. And I ended up in journalism where I'm constantly talking to. Great performers, you know, maybe it's a great politician, maybe it's a great comedian, but you always Brian end up Callen. circling that yeah. same set of questions. 
you yeah. know, like Brian Callen. Yeah. Right. And you how is Brian Callen like, so great? How is, how is it so awesome. Yeah. Right. And that, yeah. that's a question you just keep coming back. You start seeing these patterns. And I actually got a newspaper clipping about that at tennis club and ended up doing a, doing a little bit of research. And I met a documentary filmmaker and he said, you got to go there. It's, it's just beyond belief. And you begin to scratch the surface. And, you know, there's, there's kind of a tennis club like that, except they produce chess players. Um, and there's a tennis club like that, except they produce baseball players. And so, you end up, you know, visiting these places and it's kind of cross-referencing it or pollinating it with a little bit of brain science because we're really understanding what happens when the brain learns. You know, the story that we're told when we're kids is, hey, you got to have the gift. And and to give David Epstein and his stuff uh, a lot of credit, that is absolutely true in genes. If you want to be a marathoner, if you want to be a sprinter, you know, for raw athletic skills, um, it's it's pretty genes are pretty important. You, you have to have a certain. Point, you have, oh, you have oh, to have oh, a certain. Oh, yeah, you have to have a certain hardware. That also requires a certain amount of software. <clears throat> exactly, exactly. And to build the software for any complex cognitive skill, which is what we're doing right now, it's, it's if you want to be good at comedy or sales or, or writing or anything, it's about, it's about building your brain to be faster, right? Mm -hmm. All those skills are in your brain. And so habits and practice and deep practice is the, the way to think of it, I think is, is a fastest way to kind of struggle on the edge of your ability to make a real fast brain. And we think of struggles being bad, but in fact, struggle is... I think you may be found out in your youth, um, you know, with your jujitsu and, and uh, other training. Uh, certain types of struggle are, are transformative, and figuring out what that is is like working on what you're what, working on what you're bad at. I, rem I remember was always very important. If you if you if you can't kick on or punch on your left side or set shots up, then work on your left side. It was always that you know the the jujitsu guys are so good because they always, um, you know, the, 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 you're constantly you're constantly putting yourself out there physically and it's not like in a lot of martial arts studios where you know you're just you're just going you're sparring you're going through motions slowly in jiu-jitsu yep. you're trying to submit each other with everything you've got and it, it's it, it's in real time so that yeah. that's kind of but t talk to us a little bit about the concept of deep practice i love it well you know all practice is not created equal and and when you operate on the edge of your ability uh, when you're succeeding maybe 60 to 80 percent of the time is the time when your brain is forming new connections mm -hmm. and i tell a story in the book of clara Sach, uh, who is a clarinet player and she plays two songs she's part of this study where they are analyzing her learning and they videotape her practice and she plays two songs back to back the first one is the blue danube which just sounds you know bum, ba, da, 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 da. everybody <laughs> sing along yeah and and she plays it straight through and she makes mistakes doesn't pay any attention next song is this song called the golden wedding and it starts with this little jazzy riff that goes like ba, da, ba, 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 da, da, da. and she plays a couple notes and she makes a mistake and she feels a mistake and she stops it's like there's electricity being shot through the keys of the clarinet and and she and she decides to reach again and she just reads the notes and hums them and you can see like the wires of her brain sort of glowing like seeing that mistake that mistake is information you know that mistake is not really a mistake if you look at it in the right way it's information and she uses that information and anyway she practices in this way of it's very halting it's very kind of messy and she keeps on reaching and failing and reaching again and it's she's definitely in this 60 to 80 percent sweet spot and her learning velocity improves 10 times like she learns a thousand percent faster than she learns the other way so this idea that um you know it feels when it feels easy is when you're not learning and when you're actually right on the edge of your ability is you know it's, it, that's the sweet spot that's when you're actually building a faster brain you're earning faster circuitry a, a lot and of so people start... a lot of people josh Fower in his book uh, moonwalking with einstein talks about how yep. a lot of people will stop growing for example you play te you play golf uh yep. you stop at a certain handicap for the rest of your life you yep. you um you type people can get to 80 words a minute they stop improving right there um, yep. uh, even even if you have uh, somebody with uh, who's been practicing medicine for a long time, you actually don't want him looking at your mammogram necessarily right. because he's taking shortcuts. You want a hungry intern yeah. looking for something that he hasn't seen before. And and you know Josh describes in his book about how if you want to if you want to continue to grow, you've got to go back to that what you were talking about you've got to go back to kind of work of trying to type faster than you actually can on that mm -hmm. sort of on that edge yeah and our culture thinks of that work as being tedious and here's the thing i think of it as being sort of drudge work you know and when you think of it when you really flip it over and you see what actually is going on in your brain when you're doing this so-called drudge work it's not drudge work it's it's awesome you know what does peyton manning do before a game 
he sits there and he practices taking the ball from the center and just pulling it up to his chest. Like yeah. he does that ten yeah. times in a row. Yeah. Then he does the footwork, this really boring footwork that you'd see in any eighth grader do, and he does it every time. Yeah. And before Yo-Yo Ma plays a cello concert, what does he do? He plays one note. You know, he just plays one really it's good amazing. note. And so it's it's this they take this idea of what we think of as being instinctively and culturally, we think of as being this sort of real tedious drudge work that we don't really want to do. And they actually see it for what it is, which is this incredible construction act that, that you can use to get faster and better. Well, it's instinctive in our culture. It's not instinctive to all cultures. And I think that's, that's the, that's, that's the important thing is, is that, you know, what you're talking about earlier in terms of, we learn this idea that some people are just born smart. I mean, you know, in, in the straight A conspiracy, we describe that as the worst idea ever. And that's really what we're talking about. It's how you look at your practice and how you look at your mistakes. And I mean, you know, besides the talent code, you've also written this great book, The Little Book of Talent. And it's, I mean, you know, I hope this sounds like a compliment. It's a great bathroom book because the pieces are so short. You can just, you know, sit there and like read a couple of pages. But my Unless fa- you eat a lot of fiber like me. <laughs> um, In which case you can finish, finish I'm, the whole I'm thing. Just, I have, I'm very pure. Yeah. Um, but, I, but I do love, I mean, you know, you do such a good job there of saying be willing to be stupid. That's the most important thing, I think, for, for improving and getting better is the willingness to make mistakes and to, you know, bring out into the light what you don't know, your ignorance. I was introduced to this notion, Dan, when um, a friend of mine uh, was uh, uh, friends with Wynton Marsalis, the great uh, jazz trumpet virtuoso, yep. you know. And Wynton would talk about how the one thing he does nobody else does is he practices fundamentals for an hour in the morning just blowing on a reed wow. things wow. that nobody wants to do yet he, he he does the things that he was taught as a kid like where mm-hmm. you, know, you, you think you've graduated from that sort of practice from that 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 um like you were you were talking about those those fundamentals b- blowing with perfect you know i guess uh, 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 keeping time with your your breath, and that's what separates him from. By the time he was nineteen, he would take that hour every morning, and in fact, he'd be up talking to his brother late at night. And in his mind, he'd say, "Man, I'm going to be tired tomorrow," because he knew no matter what, he would wake up at six in the morning and practice for an hour. That the the thing that nobody else would do, mm-hmm. and he awesome. and yeah, it's awesome. And he and and and, and most trumpet players are like, man, I'm, I've been playing a horn for twenty years. I don't need to do that anymore. I'm way beyond that. Well, no, in fact, Winton <clears throat> goes back to those basics, those basics, those those you know. Um, and when they went, you know, there's a there's a saying for jazz musicians called woodshedding. Where they would where they would go into a essentially you know the the myth of the folklore is we go into a woodshed practice for six months or four months uh, and, and you know and with nobody around and come out with a whole new sound. Mm-hmm. That's kind of what th- that was the first time I was introduced. You know, even though I'd done, but you know, you wrestle and you did martial arts and all that. It, that that kind of deep practice was something that was always such. It's always nagged at me. I think it's you know it's always I've always said that's when you're really touching God, man, <laughs> or yeah. whatever. Isn't it? Don't you make a deal with the devil, and then you sell your soul, and you get killed on the road, and you're dirty or something like that? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Brian made that deal for being funny. He yeah, actually right. and, <laughs> and and good looking. I don't know yeah. if you've seen my jawline, but it's... his skin is remarkably uh, tight like, for like, a man uh, of twenty five. Tulip, tulip petal smooth. <laughs> the fiber, man. It's all that. That's, that's <laughs> no water weight there. That's it. Um, but wait, but 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 Dan, um, apply this to. As I as I read your book, I kept thinking, how can I kind of how can I how can I use this with my children? How can I use this with myself? How, how does the everyday person apply this to their life? Have you well, thought about you know, that? First, you have to buy a hundred copies of the book. <laughs> that is that really is true. I, yes, you do. Ninety nine won't do. Hey, I tried ninety nine, hey, and it really doesn't. It's have to an be important book. Yeah, it, it's it, huge. It, you know, it is an important book. It's it's uh, it's so accessible. You make it. You don't overwrite it. First of all, Mm-mm. it's it's. Um, I don't know, man. It's it's. I I I would give it oh, out. As a, I just I just want to let you know. I have a gene for book writing, and it just came out. <laughs> <laughs> it was just a dictation. I didn't have to do any second drafts. It was on a continuous sheet of paper. <laughs> you didn't That's even right. have to write it, really. <laughs> no, I, mean, I, it, actually, I don't even remember writing it. I just woke up. <laughs> you spoke it while your assistant did yeah. you know, typed it. Yeah. <laughs> No, 
No, it's uh, it, it's really that that parenting question really does. Uh, you know, how do you apply it? Really, is something that I've been thinking about a lot a lot lately. I've got you know I've got four kids, a range of ages, teenagers and, and sort of preteens, and and working on this project and visiting these places, visiting the coaches has totally changed mine and my wife's you know sort of parenting style. Um, it made it's made us more mellow, which which I like. Uh, because I think, the, and the main idea that's done that is this idea of the windshield, this idea that really identity is where this stuff comes from. When a kid sees someone they want to become, you know, when they see a group they want to be a part of, like those guys, I want to be those guys. And that's the moment where um, you end up with kind of the kernel of motivation that you can funnel into deep practice. Um, but without that, that's, that's kind of, that's the gateway. That has to happen mm-hmm. first. So paying deep attention to what your kids stare at is, is sort of the first parenting thing, which is cool because it's kind of an easy thing to do. You're not like looking at your kid and saying, hey, do you want to do ballet? What do you think about ballet? Right. And they go to, mm-hmm. the, to the thing and they say like, and you, what was that like? You give them the fifth degree. And if, if, they're, if they're intelligent kids, they're kind of saying, why would I want to do this? My parents are all freaked out about it. You my know, my it's, son it's, at two years old will sit at the drums and play for 45 minutes. So he has wow. clearly got a like a, a calling for that. It's incredible. He will just wow. sit with the drumsticks in his hand at two and w- wakes me up every morning saying, Dad, I want to play drums. I want to play drums. <laughs> I want to play drums. You know, it's unbelievable. And I'm like, no, you're going to you're gonna practice your ballet. That's right. <laughs> We're going to get on the bar and you're going to practice your point. Um, you're, you're right. You, you, you know, that, that's always been my thing is find out what their sort of primal urge is to begin with and and nudge them gently in that direction or at least and be like don't yeah. be a tiger parent but be kind of a johnny appleseed parent you know throw stuff out in front of them to see see what they would do in our life we took our kids to a there were a bunch of kids who played bluegrass music and there was a little concert in our town so we took our daughter there and she stared at him and she really wanted to be one of those guys you know mm-hmm. and, and her violin and she you know it's been like four or five years and she she still plays and still loves it but but it wouldn't have happened if we had forced it on or force fed her that it was really that idea of throwing stuff out in front and then seeing which sparks get lit you know sure mm-hmm. but then the next yeah you know then beyond that just kind of like celebrating the struggle you know there's a moment during piano practice or sports practice where stuff's really hard and where you're making mistakes and you're in that zone like that clarinet player and it's it's you know, it's scrappy and you're falling down and you're getting up. And, and that's the moment to kind of celebrate, when, to, to really celebrate the effort. Um, that's, that's a nice thing as a parent. And, and the third thing I'd say is, is praising for the effort and not the status. Mm-hmm. You know, if you tell a kid they're a genius, you diminish their willingness to take risk. Do you ever? Fun. Do you ever? Yeah. That's a bad Why idea. Why would they? You just yeah. told them they're a genius. Like, you are a comic genius. And do you really want to risk that by doing open mic night? Um, <laughs> exactly. You while, got too much you know? to lose. You got yeah. too much to lose. I, I, I always tell athletes, some of my friends are pro fighters, and I always say, please don't listen to don't listen to the compliments. They can be just as damaging. They're Absolutely. more damaging because what happens is somebody starts calling you a knockout artist or a submission specialist. You're going to go out there trying to fulfill that 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 beautiful image they've created, put it in your mind, <laughs> instead of yeah. fighting the guy yeah. in front of you. Please don't. Just react to what's in front of you. Well, right? you're focused on your ability rather than your actions. And that's, I mean, what, what you're referencing, obviously, is Carol Dweck's big work, which she's demonstrated so well over the last 40 years at Stanford. And I think yep. what's so exciting about the reason why I love your book and why I'm such a fanboy when it comes to the talent code is because the real obstacle that we have is there's so much great science and so much great research that is out there, but it hasn't diffused into the popular consciousness. And that's what the talent code does so well. It takes all of that science and, you know, it makes it so accessible, so interesting, so fascinating. It breaks down the mystery. Absolutely. It actually breaks down the mystery. When you see somebody who's really good at something, yeah. there was always this idea that, oh, boy, that's way out of my reach. And then when yeah. you read a book like yours, uh, you know, it, and it's important for young people because it does. It breaks down the mystery of, you know, how to get really good at something. Yeah. And I mean, it's uh, I always, you know, it's the, the difference between it's basically it's the difference between magic and science. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, that's so much of it is that, you know, what does a magician do? A magician hides his steps. Right. And then you assume that magic has happened. And I mean, that's so much of it is that we see these expert performers and we think it's magic. But, you know, there's a process. But You're what, just what, not what, seeing What it. your book also does, Dan, is it kind of it, it also is very interesting because it takes way less time in some ways. It just takes more concentrated time. Mm-hmm. Right. I right. mean, right. Yeah. Right. 
and, and which is kind of a liberating idea that you can actually get a lot done in an intense five minutes. That feels pretty good as opposed to, oh, I got to grind away for hours and hours and hours. You can, you can get, you can get a lot done. But we're raised to believe that, well, you got to practice eight hours a day. That's right. When in fact, right. no, you know, even prof- like weightlifters, Tim Ferriss wrote a good book called The Four Hour Body and, and, about, and he looked at Olympic athletes. Uh, the, you know, a lot of Olympic athletes will walk for 15 minutes, won't even run, and they get themselves in crazy cardiovascular shape because they go out seven minutes, come back mm-hmm. in seven and a half minutes. But they have to get farther in that seven and a half minutes every every day. Mm-hmm. And if yep. you have to walk top speed for 15 minutes, you can get into world class cardiovascular shape. Uh, when when uh, track athletes want to get stronger, the yep. amount of time they actually spend lifting the weight off the ground, where their body is in that tension, is about 15 to 20 minutes a month. Wow! How about I that? Love that. But so so much of this is what we're dealing with is we're dealing with a historical artifact. You know, for example, students are always told, you know, that the key to memorizing things is repetition, right? And what Mm -hmm. Josh Forward does so well in Moonwalking with Einstein is to say, no, it's not about that. It's about motion. It's about prior knowledge. It's about all these other sorts of things. The reason why we have that repetition thing is because basically they wanted to be able to demonstrate like what are the things that form human memories and so the guy who did that study deliberately removed emotion and removed prior knowledge he sat around remembering nonsense words that meant nothing mm. and he showed that yeah that does lead to repeti- that does lead to learning it's an extremely ineffective repeti- learning but so what happened is is that from that one piece of research which, which is a huge accomplishment in the history of psychology because for the first time you were able to measure something in the brain using just like flash cards basically mm-hmm. right then what happened is everybody starts talking about oh repetition that's how it works repetition 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 but of course right. you know that's not it at all it's not about amount of practice and I, i'm really you talk about dan you talk about chunking you talk about the three rules uh, t- talk a little bit about that um well you know it's fi- the, the, this idea of it all comes down to one word which is sort of reach you know that's when you get in the sweet spot and to really chunk something out, which can be anything. It could be telling a joke. It can be doing what we're doing now. It can be writing. It can be m- making a golf swing. But you break it down to its component parts. You, you, you look at a target. You reach for that target. And, and then you analyze the gap between your reach and the target. I mean, that's essentially the three-step thing that you do over and over again. And then you can combine those chunks in the same way that letters are combined into words and words are combined into paragraphs and paragraphs are combined into a story or a novel. Um, you know, our brains are built to sort of put things together and then put those things together. So it's a, it's a, it's a very simplistic way, but it's also can be a very powerful lever if you understand exactly how it works. Which, and I would be curious to get your thoughts. You've thought about this a lot, stuff a lot, Brian and Hunter, and I, especially as they regard to comedy, which I regard as kind of just an amazing skill um, in terms of flexibility, speed, um, you know, ability to improv. Uh, mm-hmm. fluency some of the some of the greatest minds I think are comic minds and and uh, I'd love to hear I how mean you let guys me just get let me get my it. hand down my pants if you could just say that one more time <laughs> a guy is, a guy as smart as Dan Coyle talking about that that's fantastic. Yeah. you know I, I have to say um, I've been doing stand-up for so long now I, I will say that what I've gotten very good at comedy is rhythm it's not unlike a song I, I can walk in and I can see a, a lot of times I'll have a guy open for me who's you know hasn't been doing comedy as long as I have you know you have a feature before you know and um, I can literally watch them for five seconds and I know I know not only the jokes they're going to tell but I also know who their influences are and a lot of times I can't wow. listen to it because it's too derivative because they haven't gotten to the point where they found their voice yet my 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 whole deal as a comic was just to try to be as original as I can. I, I've always I have so many. I've written plenty of things that I know will, ki- will kill a room as far as that they're just a trick and people will laugh. And if I do them, a little part of me dies. The idea is to try to do something that surprises and shocks you. And 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 if it shocks and surprises you, it's going to do the same to the audience. But uh, I will say that you get to a point. Um, I travel so much and I communicate with so many different audiences from Canada to, you know, every, from whether it's Mississippi or, you know, um, I've actually never done Mississippi, but, you know, uh, <laughs> but, but, but Nashville, Tennessee versus Seattle or whatever. And I'm all over the country and, and, and all over Canada. You get very good at being able to look at an audience and people don't believe me, but I can actually walk in and look at the back of their heads and feel the temperature in the room wow. and listen to the yeah. way they're talking. I know I know everything. I yep. know exactly how to start. I know exactly 
I know Taylor. I, I, I find myself even even affecting an accent almost like if it's in San Antonio, my rhythm will be way more Latin or Miami, way more Latin. It'll be it, it, it versus, say, Seattle, which is a lot of white people in sensible shoes. <laughs> it, it, it's just it's just I, and I don't even I, I don't even notice I'm doing it. But um, I've right. had people point right. that out to me who, who have followed me on the road and stuff. And and that's. <laughs> That's you develop that sort of ability to chunk a great deal of information in a very short period of time. And yeah. pretty soon when you're doing comedy, I think what happens is you're not really you're way more. You're probably more yourself within that form, within that scaffolding than you are in any other time of your life. That's when you really are. You're I guess you boil down the essence <laughs> of who you really are, right? That, that, that's the idea of I'm about to shoot this special and, and you're, you're, oh, you're constantly refining and rearranging and getting that, the perfect rhythm so that yep. you, can, you can surprise them at the end, I suppose. I don't know. But, but, but more importantly, it's, 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 it's as pure an expression of who you really are, you start to realize as, as it gets. That. Yeah. But this is, I, I mean, I, I think yeah. this is in terms of what practice can be like. It's deeply, deeply, deeply satisfying. And what you're talking about is flow. All of well, that. Once you touch that. Stuff. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Once you touch that, it's very hard to go back. Right, Dan? I mean, it's true. And I, if I, I can relate to that as a writer, but I, I can see when you're, when you're describing that skill, it's such a perfect soft skill because it's really about reading and reacting. You know, you could have been a salesperson walking into a conference room and deciding who to pitch the idea to and exactly mm -hmm. how to pitch that idea to that person. Or you could be a quarterback reading a defense, like, okay, they're covered too deep, we need to do this. And it's that speed and the fun of doing that is mm -hmm. really at the core of all those soft skills. And I think one of the challenges, I think, is that we're kind of bad at teaching soft skills. You know, you were managed to learn them on your own. Um, but in a world where those are probably the most important skills, like you're not going to get a job because you can play a violin song. You're going to get a job because you can do these sort of read, react, communicate type skills. Um, we're not good at designing spaces to teach them. And it's, it's good to kind of analyze that and celebrate that and try to figure out what that is so that you can, so you can create what amounts to kind of a cognitive skateboard park for somebody to practice those moves i mean you got you're, you got good because you're you created a practice space where you could practice those moves and learn get good feedback when you spoke like a seattle in front of san antonio people it didn't work really well so yeah you get yeah. that you immediate sort of feedback that yeah. Out. yeah 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 well, that, and, that's well, why that's why surgeons get better and better as they as they continue to practice their their medicine because they have to because, yeah okay. man that's right i mean you you either you either the patient either feels good immediately or not your feedback is constant and immediate so if you have a surgeon, you want a guy with gray hair. If you want somebody reading your mammogram, you probably want somebody who doesn't have gray hair. That, that would be Josh Fowers' idea. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I mean, and I don't know that we're necessarily that good at teaching hard skills either. I mean, you know, the, the, obviously I deal with students all day, and math is just a series of rules and, you know, facts. It's also what Dan was just talking about, yeah. isn't it? I mean, you, you break it down to its smaller parts it's really, and build it, on that. That's right. It's mm -hmm. all, I mean, basically all learning is really about the relationship between automaticity and attention. You do anything often enough, it becomes automatic. How do you make things automatic? You put your attention on them. So that's how you learn to read, right? You put your attention on your ABCs, you automate them so you no longer need to think about them. Right then, you put your attention on your words. You automate them so you no longer need to think about them, and that's all math is. You can build any sk any hard but, skill but like that. Here's a question to both of you, uh, and Dan, you can take this question first. We're talking about putting our attention on something. I was raised the wrong way in the sense that I had great parents, but my mother would always say, "Concentrate. You have to concentrate oh, and listen to my voice. You have to concentrate." She would grit her teeth. <laughs> Um, I wasn't until my Taekwondo teacher who, who would, if it was famous, if he'd teach you a hook and you'd have to hook and, and you practiced your hook on a bag or on a mitt and then it may be six months later he'd tell you something. <laughs> he'd give you like an, an adjustment or whatever it might be. But, but he wanted to instill the idea that you, you know, let's see how badly you want it. But one day I said, I can't concentrate, man. I just don't know how. And he said, I hit the bag. And I, and I hooked the bag, and I did pretty well. I'd been practicing it. And he said, did you think about that? I said, no. He goes, when you read, use the exact same mind. And that was, <laughs> that was a seminal revolutionary moment for me where I realized I can read by just letting it come into my body. Yeah, so explain, right. talk a little bit about how do, how, do we, how do we teach people that, Dan? How do we, how do we um, th that seems to be, uh, you know, it's one thing to say concentrate. It's one thing to say focus. Right. It's one thing to say put your attention on. Right. 
But how do I we? Think you have to you have to think like a designer. Mm. I think you have to think like a designer to do this. And in our age, that's hard to do. In our age, uh, every parent has the urge to butt into every problem and say constant. How many times you've been sitting at the little league field and somebody else concentrate to their kid? And it's it is your exa- same deal. It's exactly the wrong thing to say. Um, it's like saying choke. <laughs> 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 it's true, man. Yeah. yeah, it is. It's like that's not what you should be thinking about. You should. It's, it's sort of, you know, what the kinds of things that work are sort of guided discovery. You know, learning. So guided instead, discovery. I love that. So instead of instead of like, I'm reminded of the Japanese calligraphy teacher who has somebody do letters. You know, the same letter over and over again for like a year, and then one day, the guy reaches points to one letter and says, "That one's not too bad." You know, that's all you get, right? So, but, but what teaches you is the space and, and the space where you were allowed to make that hook over and over again and, and your discovery is sort of guided. You're targeted toward that bag or whatever you're well, trying I'm to still a, I'm still a pussy, but I, I know. <laughs> <laughs> We've already discovered that. That's yeah. obviously, um, that's why I got into comedy, but yeah. But he's it. a pussy with tight skin. That's, so. <laughs> and a great hook, and yeah. a great hook. <laughs> But yeah. this, this idea that we don't pay much attention to the learning space, you know, I think is a very true one. And, and to have coaches who are smart enough to spend a lot of time designing that space and who are humble enough to respect the process and not make it about the coach. I mean, most coaches and teachers you encounter, every encounter is about them. It's mm-hmm. about them. They don't put the, the focus or the, or the real, you know, the locus of control on, on the person that they're teaching. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, you know, from NBA coaches kind of strutting the sideline to kind of hero teachers. And, and really it's about, you know, creating the space. And so mm-hmm. to me, that's the interesting part. How do you design that space where you can learn, where you give, give somebody the opportunity to repeat, get really good feedback, repeat again, and have a larger sort of target they're looking for. You know, the, what's the perfect hook like? Well, that's what you're really aiming for. So, you know, create a space where they can do that over and over and get a little bit of feedback. But it's not about the coach. It's about the learner. Well, you 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 talk about, you de- devote this chapter to these talent whispers, And, and you, you found that they all were remarkably similar. Um, they were not, they were not these charismatic, you know, Vince Lombardi, Patton, <laughs> type characters in fact they were quiet usually reserved and they were very good listeners so t- talk about that a little bit it was great you know it was, it was strange to go all over the world you know from brazil to texas to moscow and keep meeting the same person but i did <laughs> it's and, incredible and, and one of the most sort of memorable times was at, at the first place i visited spartak which is the the dumpy tennis club that's produced all these champions there's a woman there who was 77 at the time her name is larissa preo which mm. uh Duh, 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 duh. Keep and going, yeah. So she's there, and, and she's teaching a class of maybe a dozen kids, and the door opens, and a little girl walks in, and she's eight. And it's her first day, and she's carrying a tennis racket in a plastic grocery bag, and she's sort of stepping into this space, you know, for the first time. And Larissa notices the girl, stops what she's doing, walks over, welcomes her, and says, and, and she has a tennis ball in her hand, Larissa does, says, leans down and looks in her eye and just says, I'm glad you're here. I'm really mm-hmm. glad you're here. And then she says, catch. And she throws the girl the ball, and the girl catches it. And it just was this incredible moment where, mm-hmm. you know, as human beings, we're always worried about our trust and safety issues, kind of our evolutionary brains are always kind of on alert. And, and this was this woman's ability to create what all of our great coaches create in us, which is this connection, this trust that your mm-hmm. jiu-jitsu teacher created in you, Brian, you know? Um, and that's what they have. They're like emotional athletes able to find a connection, find a tone, because that has to come first. That connection has to come first. So they don't just sort of stand up and give a big inspiring speech, go get them, guys. Um, that they, emotional, make, they make a personal, very, very it's targeted. Personal. It's individuals. It's not about speaking to groups. You know, It's about connecting to individuals and giving mm-hmm. you that and and that is where these people really excelled. And the other thing they excelled at was information. Not not giving inspiration, but giving information. Mm. They would be very precise. In, in, in Larissa's case, you know, rotate your wrist a little bit more this way. Move your foot out a little bit. Little pieces like they're a GPS, just saying, reach here, reach mm. here, reach here. And you could almost see the brains, you know, because this is all about building right connections in your brain. The brain's making the reach, and then the coach providing the feedback to help them make the right reach. So, you know, well, what about, about what about the overall concept? For example, I had a, an amazing 
amazing jiu-jitsu coach who a wrestling guy who said uh he said uh, head and hips head and hips head and hips i don't care control the head control the hips and the minute you're on somebody whether you're 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 standing up and you're trying to take them down or you're on the ground you're trying to control them head and hips where's where's hips where's head where's his head where are your hips where's your head what are you doing that that breaking it down that into the uh, an overall concept is immensely helpful what about that it's, I think you're exactly. That, that's exactly the person I kept meeting. You know, there's a soccer coach who kept saying, "Let the foot kiss, let the ball kiss your foot." Like, what a beautiful, vivid, simple image that you can all. You'll never forget that. What right? a feminine and, image too. What a sort of a what a you know almost like a a, a passive fight. image, right? It's not a fit. It's not a. It's not an active, aggressive yang. It's more. There's a lot more yin in that message. Notice how right. I use uh, Taoist philosophy. <laughs> God, I'm smart. I'm so. I mean, I talk about being an international podcaster. It's <laughs> uh, very yin of you to use that analogy. Yeah. It's very yin of me, right? Kiss, kiss the foot. Yeah, they're good at that, and they're good. At, and and what the other thing about these people is that that none of them are famous or rich. You know, they're all doing it for the craft of it. They all love it. They all love that feeling of mm-hmm. uh, you know of, 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 of you giving someone a message and watching that person discover a potential that they didn't know. That well, they well they're, 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 they're alchemists. They're creating gold, aren't they? I mean, they're artists. They are creating yet, gold. We don't value them in our culture as gold. Like if, if the world were a fair place, your jujitsu teacher should have a statue to them somewhere. But right? the, I mean, I'm right with you, brother. But that's the whole point. Yeah. It's a, it's a question of ego. And for the last 150 years, you know, we've celebrated the genius, right? And the idea of the lone inventor, the person who does it all against the, against the world, you know, this yeah. sort of Ayn Randian figure who like, takes matter and wields it to their will you know and the problem is is that you know that's not that's not what humanity does best humanity works best through collaboration through working together as a team and through creating an environment that is not about the individual of the ego but about what they can contribute to the group exactly i've come to hate the word gift you know gift this so one person gets a gift that's their gift and it's a possession it's the worst idea ever it's the worst. It, right. it really it, is. It's the poison pill in our society. Hmm. Right, right. And this idea that the real gift is the ability to connect and fill each other's windshields mm-hmm. and design spaces for each other and coach and teach. And Absolutely. That's, that's a gift. Absolutely. Yeah, we have gifted gifted student programs and all that stuff. I mean, that's, well, and yeah. that's and that's the point. Dweck's work has shown that you know labeling these kids as gifted does not do us any favors. Mm. You know what I mean? The point is is that the practice that we all need to be doing the, is the same, regardless of you know whether genetic ability exists or does not exist in the field of intellectual endeavor, right? And they mm. haven't found any. A Nature Neuroscience Review did back in 2010. They found 300 genes for mental retardation, zero genes for normal to above average intelligence. They've never wow. found a math gene or anything like wow. that. But that idea right. is so prevalent in our culture. And the point is, even if that stuff does exist, it's not about whether the, the reality of the genetics. It's about that idea. And that idea, as, as a, you know, an instrument of psychology, messes up everybody's process. Right. But right. there is, but, and you talk about it, and so does uh, Dan, uh, David Epstein, you do talk about, and I've never heard it quite described the way you do in your book, um, you talk about what practice and early practice does to, f- to create essentially a bundle of neurotransmitters that, that sort of almost like, like bunching together a bunch of wires. Yep. Um, yep. T- talk about that because I know that you can't really baseball players and my, my, my nephew's really athletic and he's a giant kid and he, you know, he's six, 16 and he, he squats 300 pounds for reps. He's six, one and 205 pounds. And it's, he's just all muscle. I said, play baseball, forget football. And he said, no, it's too late for me. I don't have, you know, you've got to be able to chunk a lot of information. Those kids have been playing since they were, you know, eight, five, six, seven years old. Yep. They they can they can see a pitch coming and they just can read all the signals and stuff. Um, right. So, uh, you know you're not going to be a great chess master grandmaster unless you play started playing chess before the age of twelve at least according to David Epstein's work. So I think that's true. Yeah. So so talk a little bit about that. Well, it has to do with the way brains develop. You know, and the, the thing that I'm most interested in is this stuff called myelin, which we probably remember from biology class, the myelin sheath. And myelin is the insulation that wraps around all of the wires of our brain. And when you practice something and when you get good at it, you get a thicker myelin sheath, which makes the signal move faster and more accurately. And that's kind of what skill is. Can know, we can actually practice. prove that? Can we measure yep. that? You bet. It gets wow. measured. They've done studies where they'll take that's... a bunch of piano players and have them practice. A group will practice 100 hours. Another group will practice 200 hours. And the myelin growth in the appropriate areas of their brain is proportional to the hours practiced. Are you in other kidding words, Every hour earns you a little more of this 
electrical tape that makes your signals go faster and better, and that's why I practice. Is that's unbelievable. Kind of awesome. what, what is it yeah. made of? Is it just a it's fat? It's a fat. It's a fat. <laughs> it's actually, this, it, it's exa- its function is exactly like electrical tape. It's a resistor, and for years it wasn't studied because who wants to study this, you know, inert fat? But it turns out it's it's very much not inert, and it grows in response to uh, and you to can practice. S- you can see it in MRIs. You can see it in all of that stuff, and everybody experiences it. That's what automaticity is. When something gets so easy that you don't have to think about it, that's you've myelinated that process. Yeah, somebody asked me, they were like, don't you have to get ready for your show? You're eating a whole meal and you're other. I was like, dude, you know, it's like uh, Fiona Apple. Remember the singer Fiona Apple, who, who was Artist of the Year in 1999? Now, I watched her eat a whole meal, 12 o'clock at night, drinking wine. And we go to this thing and she sings and her voice sounds better than, than, than it did on the album. And I said, I can't understand how you were able to sing like that without warming your vocal cords up. And she said, what are you talking about? I said, I know a little bit about singing. Don't you have to warm your body up? And she said, and she knows what she said. She goes, what do you, I just tell the truth. Everything else takes care of itself and kind of changed the subject. And I went, oh, oh, wow. kiss my ass, you saint. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I'm breaking up with you immediately. Uh, yeah, so. Um, That's great. There were two That's points great. to that story. One, yeah. that I dated Fiona Apple. And, <laughs> And the and the distant point is that yes, it, yeah. I'm, she probably has a lot of myelin in her brain. Uh, I, I'm, I'm that's some that's very new for me. Uh, when I read it um, in your book, I thought it was kind of a theory, but the fact that we can actually it's well established, and that's the thing. Most of this stuff has been well established for you know thirty, forty, fifty years. Yet we don't. Yet it, Dan, it hasn't gotten into our schools. Right. I mean, there are some stuff like Carol Dweck's got this thing called brainology that teaches to teach kids. And essentially, what, what's the story you want to teach kids? Your brain's a muscle. Your brain's a muscle. You want to go, go, go lift some weights with your brain kind of a thing. And that's, and that's a very effective way to tell that story and to change, change the narrative. But you, know, you were asking about kind of when's it too late for kids to get into stuff and this idea. Well, this myelin stuff arrives in a wave from the back of your brain to the front, from kind of the motor areas to the cognitive areas. And, and yeah, you, the kids can add it really fast at certain times. It's really important to, uh, if you want to speak a language fluently, to start before you're you know, about 12 you know, I, because it becomes harder to, uh, to build those circuits later on because you're not myelinating as rapidly. That's just how evolution has built us. So, um, so it becomes kind of strategic. Like, you know, it's, 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 I think we all behave in a way like, yeah, we know that you can't start playing violin at 14 and expect to play at the very, very top. But what gets lost sometimes is the real fact is not most of us are going to be at the very, very top of our profession. The real fact is we do a lot of things for enjoyment. We do a lot of things because they allow us to be in our community or whatever. So, and that practicing that way, you can still you still get a lot better when you practice and you still build a lot of myelin. You just may yeah. not be able to make the very top, top, top. Yep. That language learning window, the idea that you have to learn a language by your, the age of 12, I think that's one of those ones that as we look closer and closer, we're not going to be, I mean, I don't know that that's going to hold up scientifically. So much of it is, is that the way that... Hunter speaks about nine languages, by the way, for real. But oh, but so, so much of the way that yeah, people... We're not playing around on this podcast. Yeah, it's serious. Keep going, keep going Hunter. Serious. Brian's skin is continue just... Continue, <laughs> continue, Hunter. I, said, I just said continue, Hunter, in French. Don't worry about it. <laughs> but so, so much of it is, is that if you look at the way that people practice their first language, it's so different from the way that they practice their second language. And it's really, really simple. When you're a baby, you start back and you're practicing individual sounds, right? And then people start to learn a second language and they're like, oh, I can't trill my R in Spanish. I can't trill my R in Spanish. And that's because you're trying to say it in the context of an entire word. When I was in Panama, and this was when I was like 18 or 19, it was after my freshman year of college, I would literally sit in the shower and while I was showering, I would just go... What a nerd. No, but I mean, you, you, you focus on, I mean, that's what linguists call a phoneme, which is an individual unit of sound. And you focus on getting that individual unit of sound and then you build yep. it into syllables and then you build it into words. And so much of it is, is that, you know, the sort of deliberate deep practice that you're talking about for, you know, music and sports, we don't do that with our second languages in general. I'm still stuck on the fact that you purr in the shower. I know. I, know I do. I, I know. I make my Panamanian girlfriends do that when I'm in Panama. <laughs> Brian, you're a pussy, you and I, I purr in the shower. You see how I turn that into comedy, guys? It's pretty impressive. It's pretty impressive. Well, you did even make a motorboating joke, which I'm impressed. <laughs> see that? Oh no, no, that was the first one. But my, I've, I've got such thick myelin that I was able to jump, uh, leapfrog that 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 obvious that joke true. that you mere mortals yeah. think of first. Um, I love that, Hunter, because I think it's true with a lot of stuff. You know, there's this moment when we become adults or so-called adults when, you you know, you sort of are above practicing. You know, mm-hmm. like you don't, you know, you, you, you don't really, you want to go play, but you, you don't really want to like really dig into practice as an adult. And, 
And yet we see over and over again that that, uh, that window is getting kind of nudged out. In fact, Y.A. Yang, the, the golfer who, who beat Tiger Woods a few years ago at a major championship, apparently started golf when he was 17, you know? Wow. And so maybe there is, uh, you know, the, all the lessons of the brain that we've learned over the last 50 years can be summed up by the fact that just one sentence, which is like, the brain is pretty awesome. <laughs> and it, can, <laughs> it grows it's a lot bigger and more powerful than we ever imagined it being, and it can grow. And, and that's the mm-hmm. thing that... Um, I think gives us all a, a certain amount of, uh, I don't know, interest on the horizon. What and, about nootropics? Do you know much about that, Dan? Like the, the people are making a lot of money selling these things. What, what, what about, are there, are there herbs or drugs that, that help our brain function faster? Or does it create a, 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 does it lubricate the myelin? Is there anything like that out there? It's just a drug called, called experience and practice. I mean, you know, yeah. I've seen a lot of stuff debunked about that. When I was, Doing a lot of research for this, though, I did see some of the neurologists that I visited were taking those fish oil, which I've since seen sort of semi-debunked since then, because it is, you know, this myelin stuff is an essential fatty acid, which means, you know, you sort of have to get it from your food. Um, but yeah, I would I would say eating fish is probably a smart thing to do in that mm. in that ballpark. But beyond that, um, practice. You've got those things, well, and then you've got kind of all the yeah. brain games coming online, you know, all the yeah, but even... brain games. Which is, really interesting too even the studies of the brain games that have been done they're like yeah if you're old it's going to help prevent de- prevent dementia but you'll also get the same amount of benefit from learning a new language and the difference is, is that right. at Playing the end a guitar whatever yeah exactly be. and the point is is that at the end you can play the guitar or speak a new yeah, language yeah, as yeah. opposed to have, have a, a really high brain yeah, for no reason it's yeah. a little bit like lifting weights and not having not and yeah. sitting on a couch all day yeah I like that. That's true, isn't it? Right. Yeah. You're really good at finding frogs under lily pads. Right? <laughs> exactly. Like, oh, and so is your three-year-old grandchild. <laughs> right. Congratulations. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But so much of it, I mean, yeah, this is what what your book does so well. It's all about we have an idea of the brain that is, you know, 50, 100 years old. And the science has changed, and now it's time for our culture to change. It's a little bit like our, our notion of diet. We're still talking about low-fat, high-fiber diets, when in fact it ain't the fat, it's the sugar. If you mm-hmm. look at the new science on, on the body, I mean, it's, 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 uh, that's when you've got to start, you know. Is, is, Dan, have you done any work on, on video games and what that does to the brain? Do you know much about that? I, I don't accept that some people are using it for kind of pattern recognition. I know John Calipari, the basketball coach at the University of Kentucky, has, has explored that. He wants his guys' eyes to recognize patterns early, you know, whether it's playing defense or offense or whatever. And and they've done some – there's a program pioneered by the Israeli Air Force, I think, where they, um, you know, play – essentially play video games, eye trainers. And, and there's a woman named Dr. Cheryl Calder who's, who's kind of pioneering that in South Africa. So there, there is a lot of stuff going on with the eyes these days um it's i think pretty fascinating because that is really the gateway of so much of the skill that we're talking about it comes down to recognizing a pattern mm. and how you get better at recognizing a pattern whatever that pattern might be you know your audience or a fastball or a curveball and um you know there's there's a few even some games on the ipad that are built around that that same idea um and if you're a high school quarterback you know, you you might want to play one of those games where you really got to quickly identify what's going on and get better at that particular skill. Right. right. Um, there's a there's something that we've all sort of been referencing indirectly, and I just wanted to address it specifically, and that's emotion. Um, you know, because one of the things that has really happened in the last 50 years is is that we've understood just how important emotion is for learning. Right. If you're really enjoying something, that learning is going to happen more quickly. If you hate it and detest it, you're going to avoid it, and it's the learning's just not going to happen. Um, And so much of what Brian's talking about in terms of concentrate, concentrate with the attention is you're putting yourself in a state of stress. And so, therefore, your attention isn't available for that learning. Right. Well, you spend a lot of time worrying, man. I mean, you know, listen, most of us, my acting teacher used to say, you can't go out tonight, right? You got an audition tomorrow. You got got to get home and worry. You got to pace the floor and worry about not doing well in your audition. Is that what you got to spend the next two hours? You're not working on anything. You're just worrying. It's it's really true. Mm -hmm. The amount of time, yeah, yeah. There's a term I love, open awareness, that you want to cultivate. And I think that's something that, you know, whether mindfulness or meditation or whatever, but this idea that good performers are kind of open, which is the opposite of concentrated, and really aware of what's going on around them. And that is what leads to to performance. And, and those kinds of emotions, I mean, the emotional thing is really fascinating because really you go back to your conversation about attention. You know, where does attention come from? It comes from just interest and love and, mm-hmm. and, and story, you know, mm-hmm. like what's the story of this? And, and the best learners I ever came across and the fastest learners, I mean, 
the fastest learner on the planet, I think, is a kid on a skateboard. Like, mm-hmm. They learn. If you could teach algebra or computer programming the way those kids learn how to right. move their bodies and balance and and picture what they're doing. I mean, that's what you need to replicate. You need to be slightly off balance. You need to have vivid models to stare at. Like they have these, if you're in a swimming pool with other guys and they're going back and forth on the, the dry swimming pool and, you know, this idea that you're staring at what you want to do, you're doing it, the, you get perfect feedback. There's not a coach saying, hey, you need to move your heel two inches to the left next time because the, the skateboard's really good at telling you that. So, you know, how do we duplicate that kind of energy, emotion, attention and create learning spaces that are like swimming pools and put kids on skateboards and let them go in it without, you know, interfering. I'll well, tell you exactly how. how. It's all about removing the idea that some people are born smart and some people aren't. That's what poisons that experience. We don't have the idea of anybody being a natural skateboarder or a natural video game player or, you know, really great at picking out an outfit or anything like that. And so you see how kids approach those school skills. They just get in there, they mess around, they screw up, and they get better, and they mm-hmm. really enjoy that experience. The problem is, is that when you have that idea, I mean, the, the easiest way to understand this, right, is that we say, I feel stupid. Stupid. Stupid is a feeling. It's the feeling of shame. And shame causes you to avoid your mistakes. And that's what happens is the kids, you know, they get a bad math test back. And rather than being like, oh, that's so weird. What did I do wrong? How does this stuff right. actually work? It's interesting, they, yeah. Yeah, they shove, the, the, they shove that bad test in the bottom of their backpack, never to be seen again. And that's how they repeat for years and years and years these same basic mistakes that you can fix in five minutes. Yeah. That's interesting, right. man. Yeah. That's, that's, you it's, know. it's all, well, I what's mean, what's the next yeah. step? I mean, it all comes down to kind of a conversation about culture in a way, and how do you make gift a dirty word, you know? How yeah, do you, absolutely. How do, you, how do you inject that into the conversation? Because it is, I, I agree, it's kind of, I feel like the ship is beginning to turn, like more people are kind mm-hmm. of speaking, you and I are speaking, and, and, and thinking in that way. Um, but you still have, you know, those, those, those ideas, those narratives are still kind of out there floating in the air where people are, oh, that's... Well, the good news, the good news is we live in the information age. The good news is that these kinds of ideas do reach a lot of people. We had 250 plus thousand downloads last month on this podcast. And, it, you know, I never thought that just talking to a mic here like we do <laughs> would, would have that kind of a reach. And it, and it mm-hmm. continues to grow. You know, I talk to Joe Rogan a lot, who's got a crazy following over a million people. And I think gets at least 500,000 downloads just right every time he and more actually just, uh, you know, and, and he's always got people like yourself on who have these ideas, these new ideas, who've, who've got the data to back it up. And, and, you know, um, that that's you got to tell Joe to call me then. I will, man. Believe me, I will. Believe me, I'm I'm going to talk to him uh, about about you. You know that that's the thing about the, the, so much of it. It's it, as I get older, I wish somebody had said to me, "It's more about what you don't think about than it is what you do think about." That that's there. There is a thinking, learning how to be mentally tough, and learning how to think correctly and deep practice, as you say has as much to do with learning what not to do, what not to, you talk to bodybuilders and they'll say it's a lot of bodybuilding is, is, is how much time you spend out of the gym, Mm -hmm. uh, learning exactly how much time to spend in the gym, which by the way, can be 40 minutes a day at the most. And I think, um, if you ever talk to bodybuilders, they'll tell you that it's crazy. They're walking pharmacies as well, but even like, (laughs) you know, but even that is knowing exactly how to pinpoint, manipulate your insulin and all that stuff. So it's a pretty fascinating thing when you talk to people who are obsessed with their body and making it grow, the amount of time they spend resting, eating, and not doing any exercise is in fact, a lot of times they work out way less than most of us, which is fascinating to me. This, when they do work out, they're pinpointing and they know exactly how to stimulate and not annihilate the muscle. I mean, they'll, there's a guy I know is an old school bodybuilder who I used to work out with, and he'd work you out for 20 minutes. That's it. Mm-hmm. It's not a fun so 20 cool. minutes, I'll tell you that much, but that's all you need, baby. Yeah. It's all you need. Well, it's about understanding the mechanism. I mean, there was a time not so long ago, I mean, when you and I were, were, were kids, where running a marathon was considered to be kind of dangerous and crazy, <laughs> and they wouldn't even let women do it. because that's right. Why? Because we didn't really, our culture didn't really understand the mechanism of what it meant to get you know, aerobically fit, you know, mm-hmm. and now if any of our 70 year old 
grandmothers or mothers wants to run a marathon, it's like, well, actually, yeah, there's a step-by-step thing you can do, and you will probably be able to do it. And the great irony of that is, you know, that great book, Born to Run, I mean, there's a real, real argument to believe that what we are born to do is to run incredibly long distances. You know what I mean? And if you're, Unless right. you're from the West African coast and you're more fast twitch than you are slow twitch, <laughs> this is a racist podcast, everybody. <laughs> to blame David Epstein. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, but but yeah, I mean, I think that's the thing. It's so much of what we're talking about is the danger of conventional wisdom, and conventional right. wisdom is not necessarily based on scientific research. Oscar or Wilde the said. Oscar Wilde said everything popular is wrong. Uh, <laughs> Dan Coyle, um, what's your next book? You're a brilliant man, and we need more well, of you. You're very, you're very nice. Um, it's uh, it, it's actually about culture. I'm visiting these places that I'm calling sort of you know, really, really successful cultures and looking at the patterns of communication that happen in them. And, you know, wow. That's the really sort of cool. cliche places would be sort of like, you know, a place like a Pixar or a place like St. Louis Cardinals. Why are they in the championships every year? Or, hmm. you know, some amazing schools. What signals are they sending to those people? Um, you know, certain signals at a certain time can have a great, huge, you know, can change people. And so figuring out what those are. And I'm kind of in the early part of the process, but it's been a it's been a blast because it's kind of it's kind of leaping off of the you know the talent code stuff into this in this area and it is there's a lot of fascinating stuff research on it. I can't wait. Well, and here's a big question for you because I mean you know we we've lived in an age of moral relativism where it's become uncomfortable to talk about certain cultures being better than others, but mm-hmm. the culture of Pixar is clearly better than a lot of other cultures because it produces way way better results. Do you think that we're going to see a move past moral relativism and say you know a culture that deals with mistakes in this way is better than a culture that avoids and buries its mistakes? I think so. I think because we're, we're reaching a point, you know, where it's, it's, it's less about um, kind of, it's more about performance, you know, mm-hmm. certainly in sports, certainly in business, certainly in schools. And I think what we will be looking at now is really putting a focus on, yes, every culture is valid, but this culture performs and this culture doesn't perform right. as well. And understanding what that mechanism is in the same way that you'd understand what it is to you know, to get in shape versus uh, sitting around eating marshmallows. It's like it's better to go to the weight room for 40 minutes than that's right. not. So <laughs> I think that's the kind of culture that will be. Absolutely. And, and understand that, the, the, that there are, that we're really built to function in groups, getting back to what mm-hmm. you said before, Hunter. Mm-hmm. I mean, this, this idea that we have these preloaded switches that make us want to combine and, and, have, um, and, and work together and, and figure out what those switches are and how not to turn them off um, is a really important thing. Mm. Um, Dan, are you, where do you live? I split time between, we're in Alaska in the summers, which is where I'm from, and then I'm in Ohio during the school year where my four kids go to school. And You're in Alaska in the summers. I love it. <laughs> yep. I'm not, uh, they wanted me to come do uh, stand-up in, I think, somewhere in Alaska in the wintertime. I had to take a seaplane, and I said to my agent, I go, yeah, $55,000. <laughs> He started laughing, and I go, and by the way, I'm saying no to that. I'm not going up there. It's too cold, it's too dark, and I'm too afraid. But, Alaskan uh, audience are so appreciative. They've been, I've been in, with comedians come up to the town to visit in the winter, and they're just like, they're, the comedian's reaction is like, what's wrong with you people? Like, why are you laughing so hard at yeah, my jokes? They're yeah. not funny. But people are <laughs> very welcoming. Uh, you know what? I'm a whore for the giggle, and I'm a whore for attention, so I might have to make my way up to Alaska. <laughs> Let me know if you do. We'll get you some. We'll get you out there. No doubt. Well, it's too bad you're not going to be in Salt Lake City, <laughs> November 29th and 30th, because I'll be doing Wise Guys, ladies and gentlemen. And then, hold on, just bear with me, Dan, because I like to. I like to self promote. And then, for those lucky few who are in Philadelphia, December 12th, 13th, and 14th, I'll be at Helium. Bring your seatbelt. Apparently, I'm very funny. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then I got uh, December nineteenth, twenty twenty first. I'm at the uh, Tempe Improv. I hope they <gasps> batten down that stage because I will be splintering <laughs> with my original, original comedy. And dare I even say prose? Because apparently I'm very poetic. If you listen to the New York Times, apparently I'm the best comic ever. I was rated number one comic of all time by the International Comedy Association of America. Wow. Uh, that's a lie, Dan. That's a lie, Dan. <laughs> It's a lie, all right. <laughs> For God's sake, man, you're so vulnerable. Uh, uh, you're so gullible. Where? Wait. You're, so you're in you're in Alaska in the in the summers, and you're and you're in Ohio. Did you say? We winter in Ohio. You say that. <laughs> we, we winter, winter in Ohio. We winter in Ohio. <laughs> winter in Ohio. Make sure you stay out of that sunlight, my friend. <laughs> right. Uh, right. He's probably alabaster <laughs> white. 
Dan, Dan, thank you so much, man. Thank you for what you do. And uh, honestly, it's a, it's a, I consider it a privilege to uh, to be able to talk to you. And I, I give Hunter all the credit in the world for finding you. And, uh, um, and you know, that's all I can say. Hey, well, thanks, guys. Thanks, Hunter. Thanks, Brian. I really enjoyed this. This has been a blast. Let's do it again sometime. Stay in Absolutely. touch. You are always welcome. We love talking to you. And uh, if I'm ever in uh, Alaska slash Ohio in the winter, I will call you and come out to see a, a show. That would be great. All right, thank Tom. you. Thanks, Thank man. you so much, Dan. You're welcome, guys. Later, buddy. Bye. Take care. Bye. Awesome. Again, another awesome podcast Bow. where we learned a lot. <laughs> guy's fantastic. Yeah, he's incredible. It's just fun to talk. It's so I, I'm, I'm just so grateful for this podcast because it's I get to talk to really whether nobody's listening or not. I get to talk to. That's fun to talk to people that that intelligent. Well, and it's also so fun to like hear such a different voice. You have your group of friends and you talk about the same things and it's great, but yeah. like, you know, you need to mix it up. You know what I mean? I just realized that I'm saying he's a genius and intelligent, which is so a- a- anathema, so antithetical <laughs> to what you're what we were just talking about. And you're right. I mean, you're right. You know, it does break down the mystery of getting good at something. That's right. And it does break down the mystery of this idea of genius or this idea of intelligence. I I think um I'm t- a total convert to your to your uh, sort of belief system in that sense because it, it's it's a destructive idea because the problem is that what it does is it's exclusionary. Absolutely. You know, you you that genius is for those very few and there's no way to access it. Bullshit. And it's also the by the way the basis of every single co- co- uh, control mechanism that any totalitarian system has ever used. Mm. Saying you're not smart enough to understand this. The Catholic Church did the mass in Latin for a reason mm. so that you could couldn't understand it. You wow. know what I mean? The aristocracy was all about, you know, you're not good enough to be able to understand or grasp or Education do these things. That's right. Landowners. That's right. It's it's you know, if you can I mean, you know, that's what's so great about nineteen eighty four, right? The final battlefield. It's not about controlling Earth or the planet or anything like that. It's about controlling, controlling mind. minds. That's what totalitarian is. It's got that's right. control over the total total person. Ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna wrap this up. Um if you like to laugh, go to BrianCallen.com. I mean, I mean, I, I, I amaze myself with the way I can chunk comedy. <laughs> Later! You've been listening to The Brian Callen Show. Be sure to visit BrianCallen.com for information about this episode as well as past and future episodes. You can follow Brian on Twitter at Brian Callen and like him on Facebook. Go to Facebook.com slash Comedy. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you next time. 